Hi everyone and welcome back to The Shack. And in this episode, we'll be looking at another machine on my check it and fix it pile. And it's a machine that completely passed me by when it was first released. In the early 80s, the C64 ruled the roost. And by 1983, it was outselling every other personal computer on the market and was an absolute runaway success. Gamers, programmers and hobbyists adored it. It had the works, custom graphics and sound chips, a broad software library, playground bragging rights and peak marketing. But as it aged, its limits started to emerge. By 1984, its memory was no longer considered huge, its basic programming language was outdated and there were newer, shinier, cheaper and more powerful machines hogging all the limelight. Commodore's answer was to be somewhat pragmatic build a computer that was more powerful but still familiar, something that wouldn't alienate the vast software ecosystem that had been built around Commodore's 8-bit world, and something that would appeal as much to mum and dad's need for business apps as it did to the younger joystick wigglers. In the winter of 1985, beneath the glaring lights of the consumer electronics show in Las Vegas, Commodore's new computer sat waiting to be unveiled. It wasn't just another machine, it was a gamble, a defiant stand against the rising tide of 16-bit systems, and a promise to millions of loyal Commodore users that their beloved 8-bit world wasn't done quite yet. That machine was this, the Commodore 128. Here at The Shack, we'd like to give a huge thank you to the sponsor for this video, PCB Way. They help us out with all of our PCB fabrication needs and make fantastic boards at amazingly competitive prices. And it's not only PCBs that are on the menu. Apart from other fabrication services like CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication and injection moulding, PCB Way also have a great projects library of cool stuff to build from people all around the world. Oh, and if you don't like waving a soldering iron about, they can even assemble your PCBs for you. That's the PCB way. Right, on with the show. The C128 project was led by Bill Hurd, a talented and outspoken engineer who'd worked on previous Commodore machines, and what he aimed to deliver was hugely ambitious. Firstly, and most importantly, backward compatibility. The new machine had to run Commodore 64 software flawlessly. The C64 had an enormous software library and abandoning it would be suicide. Secondly, and obviously, it needed more power, more memory, a better basic and an improved display to make it more appealing for business users. Thirdly, a second processor, it should be able to run CPM, an operating system used on business machines to give it credibility beyond gaming. If all went well, this wasn't to be another Commodore Plus 4 misfire. This was a serious, well thought out evolution. And so the C128 was born as a three computers in one system, C128, C64 and CPM utilizing a Z80 processor for total compatibility. This dual processor design was ingenious but also complex, perhaps too complex, and also time had been against them. With just weeks to prepare, Commodore scrambled to get the C128 ready for its debut at CES in January 1985. It was going to be a make or break moment. When the doors opened, the response was electric. Attendees were stunned. A fully backward compatible C64 successor, a system that could run business software and play games, even journalists who had been skeptical of Commodore's direction admitted it was a brilliant strategy. There was only one problem. The rest of the world had been moving on too. When the C128 finally hit store shelves in mid-1985, it faced a rapidly changing market. The Commodore Amiga 1000 was released just months later, boasting true multitasking, 16-bit graphics and an impressive graphical user interface. And the Atari ST, Jack Tramiel's revenge machine, was also making waves as an affordable 16-bit alternative. On the business front, Microsoft released Windows 1.0 in 1985, breaking PC business software out of its DOS shackles, and the 386 processor was launched, giving PC users a nice performance boost too. 
gamers had the newly released Sega or Sega Master System and the Nintendo Entertainment System to play with, and even the first ever domain name, Symbolics.com, was registered in 1985 for this newfangled internet thing. Despite this, the C128 sold well, but it never matched the C64's dominance. Many developers stuck with C64 mode, and business users were already moving on to IBM PCs. The CPM mode, intended to make the C128 a business machine, went well largely unused, as CPM was already becoming obsolete. By 1989, the writing was on the wall. The 8-bit era was over. Commodore shifted its focus entirely to the Amiga, and the C128 quietly disappeared from production. Ok, so that was a bit of a potted history of the C128, from what I gleaned from Tinterweb, rife with errors and omissions no doubt. I never had one of these, didn't know anything about them, and hadn't even seen one in the flesh until this one came into my hands as a non-working example. Now, by non-working example, I mean that there's no display through any of the digital outputs. You simply get a black screen like this. Power's on, so I know that the juice is flowing, and interestingly, if I connect this to a TV through the RF modulator, we do get a picture just off the BBC2 signal around C36, just like old times, eh? So that means it is working, which is great, but we don't want to have to put up with RF output, so let's open her up and take a good look on the inside. Gently does it with these cases as they have the rather fragile plastic clips to keep them together and we don't want to snap any of those off. Once the clips are, well, unclipped, we'll move the case to the side and remove this screw that presumably acts as an earth for the keyboard to the mainboard. Once that's out, we can pull off the keyboard cables and set the top aside to reveal all of that lovely RF shielding that also doubles as a heatsink for most of the lovely custom chips quick whiz round with the screwdriver and we can get that RF shield out of the way too to reveal a main board that is well shall we say busy. Now as we're getting a picture through the RF output there can't be anything wrong with any of the major ICs so the problem must be somewhere around the video generation circuitry so let's just pop the cover off this little box in the middle because that's where our video signal begins with the VIC-2E chip and the VDC chip which handles the 80 column output RGBI mode. I'm planning on a full C128 special going into a lot more detail about the inside setup of the machine but I'll do that once I've got this particular machine and its sibling the C128D or desktop model working as well. So according to the schematics the video out signal is sent to the video out socket via the RF modulator and as the RF signal is working we can assume that the fault lies between the RF modulator and the socket, so I'm thinking dry solder joint is a likely suspect. So we'll begin the process of tracing the signal that starts here, we'll remove the modulator top cover and hopefully find where the break is to this socket here. A quick visual inspection doesn't reveal anything amiss and I can't see any damage at this point. Let's get the old multimeter out and start prodding around. Well, there's nothing apparently wrong with the connections out from the RF modulator to their first termination point. So at this point, we've either got bad capacitors here or there's a break in the signal after this point. Let's take a look at the back of the board and follow the signal there. Now, well, that's not a good sign, is it? There's definitely corrosion in a few places here, notably in the area of the video output circuitry. And while we're here, have you seen what I've seen? Well, that looks like a patch wire to me, so perhaps this has had an attempted fix previously. Let's see what the continuity is like across these corroded points. Well, pretty non-existent, which is likely our problem. So let's get all of this cleaned up with some isopropyl alcohol and we can get this under the microscope and assess the damage. Thank you. 
With the worst of the corrosion cleaned away, let's see if we can get continuity now. And no, we can't. Okay, let's dive in for an even closer look. Under this level of magnification, we can see what looks like a small blob of glue or something next to this solder joint and right on top of the trace. But look at what it actually is. A huge, well, relatively chunk of corrosion sitting there all stealthy like. Let's do our best to clean it away and see what's underneath. Well, actually that doesn't seem to have eaten too much away. Let's recheck the signal in case we've somehow made it all better by cleaning it. And nope, still dead. Okay, let's scratch some of the solder mask away and see if we have connectivity right up to the pin. And we don't, until suddenly we do. I'm convinced this needs reflowing, so I'm going to give this area a really good clean and then reflow all of the joints in this section. Then we'll plug it back in and see what we get. So what happens to solder joints that means that a reflow might sort out an issue with conductivity? Well, simply an old solder joint can become loose or dry and then it might not bond properly with the pad or component it's meant to be attached to. A dry joint will usually look dull or cracked and it can cause things to stop working or work on and off. Reflowing just means heating up again so the solder melts and bonds like it should often with a touch of new solder too, fixing the connection, well hopefully. I'm going to take out this old patch wire as well because I wasn't getting consistent connectivity across these pins anyway and it was probably contributing to the issue. Quickly reflow those pins that had the patch wire on. Checking the connectivity across this trace now seems good at first, but the connection quickly becomes intermittent. And there's no connectivity at all across the trace where that patch wire was. Now, interestingly, there's connectivity between the right hand pin and the left hand end of the trace wire, but not to the pin. And here we can see that there's a break between the trace and the pin at this end. So let's build a little solder bridge from the pin to the exposed trace and see if that can replace that patch wire. Connectivity restored. Ugly patch wire relegated to the scrap pile. Now, how about the other trace that had all the corrosion on? No, no, that's still a dud. So my thinking is that this is in the same place. We may have a similar issue. Maybe there was an impact or some internal fault on the board. So I'll just do the same thing here, expose a bit of trace wire, build a solder bridge and test again. Right, fingers crossed everyone. Well, that's a nice solid signal now. Why don't we plug it all in and see if we get a signal through the video out to my SCAR input on the telly. Okay, I'm chalking that one up to a success, so far at least. I'll be running a full set of diagnostics on this machine as part of the comparison video with the 128D. For now though, let's put the machine back together and change the thermal paste while we're at it. So we'll clean all the old paste off with some IPA so that we've got nice clean surfaces to work with. Apparently the C128 can run a little hot, so whereas with the C64 I don't worry too much other than the SID and the VIC chips, I'm going to keep all of the heat sinks in place here. 
and that includes this, which isn't just an RF shield, it's part of the cooling dynamics for the board and touches all of the main chips to keep them lovely and cool. With all the old thermal paste removed, we can magic on some new stuff. Lovely, right, while I'm putting this back together, I may as well hit you with a little request, especially now that the channel is going to be my full-time job from July this year. If you like the channel, please subscribe as it will really help the channel to grow, and it needs to if it's going to keep me and Mrs Retro Shack in beans on toast. Please also consider becoming a member on the channel so that other than eating and drinking, we can continue to invest and grow it. I have modest ambitions to get to 100k subscribers, having now reached the third waypoint, and it's made me hungry for more. And I do so want to get some new fancy tea towels. Okay, so this machine is off the fix-it pile for now, and you'll be glad to know that the schedule of videos is going to be ramping up in line with the fact that I can now focus fully on the channel. I've got loads of cool stuff in the works, including finally getting that Archimedes A3000 up and working again. There's some Amiga stuff coming soon, and of course, some new builds. Please leave your comments on this and other videos, as we always like to read them, and until next time in the shack, very soon I promise, it's goodbye from me.